Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. I need your help. I'm going to invite you to join me now in singing a song. It's one you all know. You sung it since you were a child. Don't be shy. If I catch one of you not singing, I'm going to get you and bring you up here and we will sing a duet together <laughs> or a trio or a quartet. I can stay here a long time. So are you ready? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's not bad. Y'all could be the audience at a Prairie Home Companion next week. So today I want to speak with you because it's Bible Sunday, a little bit about the Bible. And I'm aiming this sermon at these people who are seated right down here, but it's really for any of you who is young at heart. Actually, this sermon is about letting go, but most of us have so many tightly held attachments that I'm going to have to sneak in the back door and catch you on off guard to get that across. So if you want to leave here pretty much as you were when you came in, get your guard up. You know, when it comes to the Bible, most of us have a tendency to see what we expect to see, what we have been taught to see. I think one of the great failings of the education programs in all Christian churches, Protestant and Catholic alike, is that we have been taught what to see and not how to see. So we can look directly at passages in the Bible and not see what's in there because we have attachments that keep us from seeing. I've taught in two different seminaries in my career, one Protestant, one Roman Catholic. I've served in five different churches, and I can assure you that what I just said is true. I would show my students, for example, that there are two creation stories in the book of Genesis. In one, God makes human beings on the sixth day of creation after everything else is finished. And in the other, God makes human beings on the first day. Now, most students couldn't see the two different stories because they were sure there's only one. We have our attachments. People just don't like the creation story where God makes humans and cows on the first day. Humans are supposed to be the best things God ever made, so what are we doing sharing a birthday with cows? But that's what the Bible says. Yeah, but as some of my students would say back, God gave dominion to humans, right? Not to cows. That's why we eat cows and cows don't eat humans. God put us in charge and said we could do whatever we wanted to with creation. Humans are at the top of the pyramid and everything else, I mean everything, is all beneath us. That's what many people think and believe. So that's how we behave. We have attachments. Further, if we read the Bible, if we read it at all, we like the parts that are about us. We like the part that says, ask and you will receive, knock and it will be opened, seek and you will find. We like the parts of the Bible that not only promise us things, but also tells us how to get them because we love our attachments. Now, how did we get in this position? How did we allegedly rational human beings get in a position where we can be blind to central biblical teachings that are right in front of our noses. Well, here's a brief summary. Somewhere around a quarter million years ago, humans came on the scene. Now, I know there are some people who contend the earth was created in 4004 BC, actually on October 23rd, about 4 p.m. in the afternoon. I really hope you're not in that demographic, but 
for the sake of this sermon, it really doesn't matter. What does matter is that when humans first came on the scene, there was no Bible. Well, there was a Bible. It was all of creation, everything. In the beginning, our ancestors saw the great spirit or God all over creation in many, many different ways. Our early ancestors saw the sacred everywhere, in the wind, in fire, in blood, in the plants and animals that they ate. As time passed, an insight occurred in the Middle East that there was actually just one God. This God is off, out there, up there somewhere. Some people embraced this notion, some didn't. And that difference of opinion in and of itself led to great conflicts with various groups trying to persuade others of the validity of their position by killing them. This tactic, though it has never proven to be effective, continues to this day because we have our attachments. Now, this God, before humans had discovered much about themselves or the world on which they lived, had a relatively easy time of it. God would wake up in the morning, and perhaps after making a pot of coffee, he would get the sun out and start it on a journey across the sky. And in the process, he would take down the stars and moon and put them in the closet until he needed them that night. This is a very male God. And then he would sit down with a cup of coffee and the morning paper. Early on, there was not much for this God to do. Not that many people on earth, for one thing. Eventually, God gave people a set of rules to follow, and if they did that, things would be just fine. If they disobeyed the rules, they got the rain, the crops grew, cattle stayed healthy. If they didn't, no telling what would happen. Once, God got so mad at people on earth that he flooded the entire earth and started over. Now, to God's credit, he did apologize later and promised never to do it again. So as their experience with this God grew, a special group of people grew up called scribes. And they wrote down what they understood God to be commanding them. And then they added a lot of their own rules and regulations to it. And these writings in our Bible we refer to as the law. Soon, another group of people grew up and said, uh-uh, you got the whole thing wrong. You're not doing as God desires. And frankly, you're a pretty rotten group of folks. And what they had to say got written down too. And we call these writings the prophets. There were some really wise people during this time and what they say got written down. And we call this the wisdom literature in the Bible. And of course, they went to church, not as we understand it, but the people by now called the Jews had a genius for liturgy, and they developed rites and rituals and hymns for every season of the year. And you can find the hymns in what we call the Psalms. The time that passed between the exodus of the Hebrew slaves toward the Promised Land and the birth of Jesus was around 1,400 years. And as you know, Jesus caused quite a stir. He broke all sorts of rules and regulations that the religious establishment had put in place to make sure that the commandments of God as they understood them were kept. Jesus spoke from a place he called the rule of God and he invited people to enter into this realm of empowerment with him. And those who did became transformed people, full of joy and forgiveness, full of love for one another, unafraid of the consequences of their behavior. What they caught heck for was not giving allegiance to Caesar because they affirmed that they had one Lord and one Lord only, and that was Jesus. Of course, soon stories about what Jesus did and said began to circulate, and some of these were written down so that they could be read to people who had never heard of Jesus. A guy named Saul had a mystical encounter with Jesus and got a new name, Paul. He's the one for whom this church is named. He started several groups of Jesus followers all over the place, and then he had to write letters to help these people understand what he meant and to solve problems and answer questions. Soon, all of these writings were gathered into one collection, and the man responsible for this was a church leader named Arrhenius. Now, actually, he is the first one we have any record of as referring to the Jewish scriptures as the Old Testament and the writings about Jesus and his followers as the New Testament. 
At the time of Irenaeus, there were many, many different tellings of the Jesus story, but he decided that we should have just four. His uh, logic sounds crazy to us now, but you have to remember that this was during a time when people thought the world was flat. He wrote, there are four winds, four directions on the compass, four elements, four pillars of the church, therefore there must only be four gospels. He did mention many of the gospels that were discarded, the gospel of Philip, the gospel of Thomas, the gospel of Judas, the gospel of Mary Magdalene and others. Thank goodness the Jews didn't believe in destroying sacred writings and they were able to secret many of these away. And thank goodness to modern biblical scholarship and archeology, span we've been able to recover many of them. Now the institution charged with taking care of these sacred writings was of course the church. The church really gained power when Constantine made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. In fact, it was Constantine who called the first church council and he said to the leaders of the church, you guys, all guys, you got to get your act together and agree on what you believe. It was a nasty political fight, much like denominational politics today. The group with the most money and the most influence won. That's why the headquarters of this newly formed church was put in Rome and came to be known as the Roman Catholic or Universal Church. Now, if you know anything about church history, and I hope you do, you know that there are many chapters of it that are as ugly as can be. There is beauty and compassion as well. But in addition to starting hospitals and orphanages, we have a history of pulling some pretty dumb stunts because we have our attachments. For example, when Galileo confirmed the work of Copernicus and said that the earth was not the center of the universe, but the sun was. It raised such a stink that Christians started killing each other all over the place. It's known as the Inquisition of 1633. The church became so stubborn in its insistence that Galileo was wrong that it did not officially admit that it had made a mistake until 1992. Now that's an attachment. In some significant ways, the church has not recovered from this stance. Most mainline Protestant churches, even ours, weekly recite a creed that was written from a pre-Copernican worldview because we have our attachments. Historically, the church has not been good at embracing new truths and insights. We're attached. This sermon's about attachment. Had I mentioned that? So, to this day, you mention the word that Charles Darwin introduced to our vocabulary, evolution, and you can start fights. Darwin, and now evolutionary cosmologist, are challenging the church's long-held beliefs about creation and origins. Further, before you could say monkey see, monkey do, Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung come along to say that we are largely unaware of who we truly are and that we are more related to each other and all others on the planet than we truly want to be. This is hard for many to see because we have our attachments. Battles caused by ignorance of these truths rage around us at all levels and in many spheres to this very moment. That seems so ironic to me for a group who swears its allegiance to a teacher who said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. What seems to be truer to our experience is that if the truth varies from what we want to be true, the truth just makes us mad because we have our attachments. Marcus Borg, who has spoken here a couple of times before was one of the greatest Jesus scholars of our time, relates a story of a woman who came to him after a lecture he gave and she said, Professor Borg, are you absolutely sure about what you said tonight? He said, which part are you referring to? And she said, the part where you said Jesus was Jewish. Surely that can't be correct. 
Borg said to her, yes, I'm absolutely certain Jesus was a Jew. To which she replied, well, surely his mother wasn't. <laughs> we have our attachments. All of which gets us right to the story from Mark's reading today. This gospel story, which is also in Matthew and Luke, it's about a very remarkable man. You know, he is the only person in the gospel of Mark that Jesus is said to love. He is also the only person, at least in Mark, who turns down Jesus' invitation to follow him, and his decision devastates him. Jesus then follows up this man's decision with an image I've always thought was one of the funniest word pictures Jesus ever created, and that's the picture of a camel trying to go through the eye of a needle. Of course, the disciples didn't see it as funny. They began to panic. If this man, a man so good, Jesus invited him to join their group, can't make it, then who can? The man comes to Jesus wanting to know what he can do to live in God's presence forever. And he believes Jesus can tell him. The man's a good man. He's a sincere man. He listens as Jesus goes over the commandments. Jesus doesn't go over them all, just the important ones about how humans are meant to treat other humans. And the man says to Jesus, I've done these things. And I, I, I picture him standing there. He's built up some spiritual muscle. He's done his daily spiritual practice. He has reason to believe that he can do what Jesus is going to ask him to do next. He's ready. He's willing it is then when Mark says Jesus loved him. And this, Jesus says to the man, you lack one thing. Go sell what you own, give the money to the poor, and come follow me. Jesus had put his finger on the one thing the man needs more of, and that's less. Now, you would think the disciples would have been overjoyed at this teaching. After all, they had left everything to follow Jesus, but they aren't overjoyed. They're upset. And Peter, dear old always putting his foot in his mouth, Peter, says, well, what about us? We've left everything to follow you. Eventually, we're going to get a lot out of this, aren't we? And Jesus assures him, yes, yes, you're going to get a payoff. But I want you to notice what's on the list of benefits that are in store for Peter and the others who had left all to follow. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, fields with persecution. I can hear Peter thinking, fields of persecution? That's not on my list of what I was hoping for. The rich man was attached to his treasure here on earth. Peter was attached to his understanding of a treasure yet to come. They both were attached, and that's what to me the story is all about. They were attached to what they had and what they could do, and Jesus loved them too much to let them go on thinking that they were in charge. You see, the one who possesses cannot receive, because the one who possesses is constantly clinging in a way that grasps and controls. Oh, there's plenty of doing to be done here on earth. God knows there is. But Jesus knew and wants us to know that it's not our doing that gets us to be recipients of the love of God. So, in case you've drifted off, here's this sermon in a sentence or two. There's nothing you can do to get God to love you more than God already loves you. Nothing. And there is nothing you can do to get God to love you any less than God already loves you. Nothing. Whether we choose to live in the realm of this awareness, that's up to us. It requires a childlike faith that affirms, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. In the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, life giver, may we so live.